Thank you, Madam President. Ladies and gentlemen, the Senate, this bill has to do with um, emergency risk orders, more popularly known by their uh, euphemism as red flag orders. We passed the red flag bill back in the 2020 session, and um, now today, about 19 different states have red flag orders in place. Florida has actually used theirs over 2,300 times, uh, and it's, only, it's been used in about 78 counties in Virginia, but we've only had about 403 of these orders ever issued in our state, and we have about, I think it's about 40 counties, maybe 50 counties, where no red flag order has been issued yet. Just for everybody's information, um, Fairfax County has the most, obviously has the largest population, 127. Uh, the list beyond that is not, it's not a, it's not a list, the, the order of the ranking on the list, I would not tell, say is what you would identify as like a partisan type list. The number two on the list is Hampton, number three is Virginia Beach, Prince William's number four, Hanover County is number five, Colonial Heights is actually number eight, York County is number nine, uh, Dinwiddie is number 11. So th this, this, these orders have been used in a, in a, I would say an odd pattern, but what is apparent at least from my perspective, is that some counties just don't seem to quite understand the use of these orders and when they're supposed to be used. So what the legislation does, I would just note, Chesterfield County, one of the largest in the state, has only used the red flag order proceeding three times, Henrico once, Fauquier zero, Roanoke twice, um, Roanoke County once, the city twice. And basically what this bill does is it sort of fleshes out the different factors that a magistrate issuing a, a, an ex party order should look at, may look at, and then the orders that they, the different uh, factors that they have to look at, which I think will help everybody have a much greater understanding as the types of conduct that might engender a need for somebody to seek a red flag order. I would note also, Madam President, that I think it was last year, the United States Congress passed a bipartisan, bipartisan act to create a $750 million grant program to encourage states to develop red flag programs. And I would just note that the former president, the last president, actually endorsed the whole red flag concept. This is not a partisan idea. That bill passed the United States Senate 65 to 33, passed the House 234, 193, had the support of People like uh, U.S. Senator Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, Joni Ernst, John Cornyn, Roy Blunt, Richard Burr, Marsha Blackburn. We're not talking like the liberal part of the Senate here, the United States Senate. Polling shows that our red flag laws are support supported by 85% of the public and 78% of gun owners. Again, this is not a Second Amendment issue and it's not a partisan issue. The bill just makes it clear the kinds of evidence that the court should and can consider. I think it'll provide clarity to courts. It'll provide clarity to our jurisdictions. It's good policy. You know, we've had several mass shootings in Virginia just within the last three months where red flag orders may have actually avoided some unfortunate deaths. We need to pass the bill. Thank you, Madam President. Chair recognizes the gentleman from... Madam President... Would the gentleman yield for a question? Will the gentleman yield? I'll yield. The senator yields. Madam President, I would ask uh, the gentleman whether the statistics he read about the uh, lack of utilization of the red flag statute and uh, the counties that he ticked through, uh, are those the number of instances in which the process has been started or the number of red flag orders that have been issued by courts. Senator Sorovell has the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Excuse me, I would answer the gentleman by saying, first of all, I have, I have, there's two types of orders that can issue. One is the emergency, the emergency SRO, which is one that's issued on an ex party basis uh, without a, a full two-sided hearing. And I have the data for that. Then I have the data for the final SROs, which is, is obviously a lower number because after the evidentiary hearing, some of those are not granted into a final SRO. So the data I read off, I believe, was the emergency SROs and not the final SROs. Madam President, further question. Further question for the gentleman. I'll yield. Madam Senator President. yields. Senator Obenshane has the floor. 
Madam President, I would ask the gentleman whether the statistics, he ha whether he has the statistics as to the number of times that the process has been instituted, initiated in each of those counties, and whether those are substantially higher than the number of uh, emergency orders or final orders that are issued. Senator Sorovell has the floor. Um, Madam President, I would note that orders, emergency orders were granted 403 times and final orders were granted 235 times. So uh, that would suggest that around 60 percent of emergency orders turn into final orders on average statewide. Madam President. And I have it by jurisdiction if you want it. I will wait my turn and uh, speak. Senator Stewart, the gentleman from King George. Thank you, Madam President. Will the gentleman yield for a question? Will the senator from Eastern Fairfax County yield? I'll yield. The senator yields. Uh, thank senator you, has the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, as, as this bill uh, clearly uh, at least suspends a constitutional right, which is enshrined in the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution, does this law still uh, deny a person who is a subject of that order due process of law? Senator Sorovell has the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I would say the answer to that is no. And just to clarify what I mean by that, um, the Senator, I'm sure, remembers the lengthy debate we had about this back at the Science Museum a few years ago. I believe the junior senator from the city of Richmond had a lot of questions about the due process pieces of this back then. And uh, we built all kinds of due process controls into this, including, I believe, one of these petitions can't even start until the Commonwealth attorney initiates the process. In other words, like, I can't go down and say Richard Stewart said some things and go get something to the magistrate. So first of all, you have to, there's a couple different gatekeepers. I believe the law enforcement has to investigate as well before it can initiate. Then, uh, after the 14 days, there's a, um, and then there's a, a, a judge has to find that everything based on the affidavit is sufficient. Um, there's another element of due process there. Then you get your 14-day hearing. You get due process there before the final order was entered. I would just note that the process, I think, is actually more robust in its protections than we provide for family abuse protective orders, child abuse protective orders, which also the right to parent is a fundamental constitutional right. The right to live in your house is a fundamental constitutional right. All those constitutional rights, actually, those rights actually have less procedural due process protections than your right to possess a gun. And so I would submit that um, this has plenty of due process in it. Gentleman, yield for another question. Will the gentleman yield for another question? I'll yield. The gentleman yields. Senator Stewart has the floor. Thank you, Madam President. That was a very lawyerly answer. So I'll try it a different way. Before a right which is enshrined in the Bill of Rights is suspended, does the individual who is the subject of the petition have the opportunity to have a hearing before a judge in a court of law with an attorney of their choosing to represent them? Senator Sorovilla has the floor. No. We debated Thank you, that Madam and discussed President. it. Chair again recognizes Senator Obenshane, the gentleman from Rockingham. Uh, Madam President, speaking of the bill. Senator you know, may continue. You know, what, what I think I've heard is, number one, uh, I heard in committee this morning uh, in a moment of candor that this is uh, an expansion of the red flag law. Uh, that is what was said in committee, and uh, I would agree with that. Uh, that it is an expansion. Uh, what I've heard on the floor today is that the red flag law, in the opinion of uh, some, uh, is not utilized enough. Uh, I've heard uh, that, you know, when we debated this uh, law to begin with, uh, one of the significant concerns that was articulated by uh, many uh, opponents of it was uh, were concerns about uh, improper uses of 
the red flag law. For example, retaliatory uses, uh, uses uh, in you know, domestic disputes or employment disputes or in other uh, instances. Uh, I would posit that perhaps the law is working. Perhaps uh, it is uh, not a situation in which uh, counties across Virginia don't understand the law. Perhaps uh, there are instances in which the process has begun, but because of improper uses or for other reasons, lack of evidence to support it, uh, not even the first order is issued. What I have not heard uh, is any instance in which a red flag complaint was made but rejected in which harm has occurred to anybody in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, in the absence of that, I would suggest that this is a further effort to expand this for the purpose of advancing uh, this agenda, which uh, I would respectfully submit is not justified by the facts or by data. I would uh, hope that members would vote no. Chair recognizes the junior senator from Richmond, Senator Morrissey. Thank you, Madam President. Speaking on behalf of Senate Bill 1067. The senator has the floor. I would suggest to the body that I think we're getting away from the, the soul of this bill, and that is to help individuals and the community for somebody that has the potential of creating some really horrific harm. This morning we heard a bill in judiciary, I believe the sponsor was the gentleman from Prince George, about an individual that was aware that there could be somebody about to act um, and create some danger to call this number to alert them. That's the genesis of Senate Bill 1067. Not to take away anybody's rights that are enshrined in the Constitution, but rather prevent some horrific carnage. And must I remind the body that we've already had in this country alone 680 mass shootings this year. Some of them occurred in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So if you focus on the, the soul of 1067, you will see it is to protect the community and not disenfranchise anybody of their constitutional rights. Thank you, Madam President. It is not allowed for the members of the gallery to clap. Thank you. Chair recognizes Senator Sorovell, the gentleman from Eastern Fairfax County. Thank you, Madam President. If no one else decides to speak, speaking to the bill. The Senator has the floor. Thank you, Madam President. So I just want to say a couple things. First of all, this is not an expansion of the law at all, whatsoever, in any way. I corrected myself in committee. It's not. Uh, this basically just makes clear what evidence the court can consider. If you look at the language that's in this statute, it was taken from the Florida statute. Again, Florida is not some you know, bastion of progressivism at all, I would say. Florida has been one of the most aggressive states in using these laws, and that's where these factors came from. Number one. Number two, everybody needs to remember what a big part of this focuses on. The number one, the number one source of firearm deaths in America is suicides. 54% of all firearm-related deaths are suicides. This bill, the red flag law, is directly designed to prevent people from killing, killing themselves. And that's something that ought to concern everybody. Reducing suicide is a good thing. But to say, number three, to the gentleman's concern that these types of orders could be used uh, maliciously, somebody could make something up to try to cause a problem for somebody. I've not read of that happening yet. I would think if that were to happen, it would be heavily publicized, but I would note that that person also would have the ability to bring a civil cause of action for either malicious prosecution or abuse of process, probably abuse of process. But they'd be able to file for damages and recover money if they, if they were treated that way. And the last thing I would say is that, uh, you know, just in November, we had two mass shootings within, I think, about 10 days of each other. We had three people, four people shot, three people killed at the University of Virginia. 
by somebody who had some clear signs of emotional instability, threats of violence, et cetera. It's not clear whether that ever got communicated to law enforcement or not in a timely fashion. But there certainly were all kinds of factors out there that suggested that that man was a candidate for red flag order. And then shortly thereafter, seven days, or shortly thereafter, we had seven people killed at Walmart in Chesapeake. And from what I've read on that, that guy was saying things at work, but nobody acted on it. But I think if somebody had acted on it, uh, there would have been an opportunity to take a gun away if he had one. Or I think he might have bought it the same day, put an order on him so that when he went to buy the gun, he wouldn't have been allowed to buy it. So I'd submit, Madam President, that um, these red flag orders are they're a good thing. They'll keep more Virginians safe and alive. Uh, they have plenty of due process. And I would hope we could continue to do things to take advantage of also this $750 million of federal money that's out there to help us administer this program, to help our localities administer. And I'm looking forward to the administration's announcement as to how much of that money they're going to be seeking for use in red flag proceedings. The question is, shall the bill pass? Those in favor of passage will record their votes aye. Those opposed, no. Are the senators ready to vote? Have all the senators voted? Does any senator desire to change their vote? The clerk will close the roll. Ayes 23, no 16. Ayes 23, no 16. The bill passes.